Alexander the Great and the Business of War, Part 1. Alexander the Great has gained an immor immortality and a strong presence in our minds as well as in our history books. Known for a greatness of military genius and diplomatic skills, he conquered most of the known world of his time and brought on a new era of the Hellenistic world. But who really was Alexander the man? The intention of this article, or mini lecture, is not to go into the whole history of Alexander's invasion and conquest of the Near East, but rather to look at the man himself. In doing so, we will understand why Alexander invaded and will dispel some of the myths about Alexander's intentions, in turn helping us to understand why the Greco-Macedonian Empire broken apart a little over a hundred years after his death. Nearly all traces of his once glorious empire have been tossed into the ash heap of history. The War Business The army that King Philip II of Macedon left to his son Alexander was a semi-professional and a paid fighting force. In order for Alexander to pay for this army, either he had to disband a portion of it to save money, risking much in doing so, or he had to go on the march to save his kingdom. Alexander chooses to save his kingdom at another empire's expense. Alexander needed to pay the bills and would do so by looting Persia. He proved what Randolph Bourne once said, quote, war is the health of the state, end quote. Alexander was the state and war was his business. Therefore, revenge was the excuse to avoid personal monetary debt. Besides Alexander's dilemma and possibly going into debt within a matter of weeks, he also had a rather large personal ego to contend with as well. Upbringing and Education Alexander's ego is said to have been rather massive. His mother had huge expectations of him and led him to believe that he would conquer Persia. If you think about it, the only huge deed at the time in proving one's destiny was to conquer Persia, for it was the biggest challenge at the time in the known world, at least in the Greco-Macedonian sense. Besides being hounded about his destiny, he also was a competitor from birth, as he would try to outdo his father in combat, being more aggressive in battle, and showing absolute courage in the face of danger just to win Papa's approval. Alexander worried that nothing would be left to achieve beyond the successes of his father, Philip. Besides his home life, Alexander was enthralled by the epic poems of Homer, and the detailed journeys into war and individual heroism. These themes fueled the young Alexander's imagination as he grew along with the help of his tutor Aristotle. The works of Homer instilled the romantic rebels of the Greek legend, such as Achilles or even Hercules, who Alexander modeled himself after and who he claimed to be descended from. While Aristotle approved, provided the reasoning in Alexander's curriculum, Alexander's father Philip taught him war. However, once Philip died, Alexander set off on his journey, and the rest is history. What set Alexander east was due to debt, but, but, he had an, but he had his ego not only been so bold and his character not so for risk-taking, history would have been a little different. Like Achilles, Alexander died before he accomplished his dream of destiny, but the outcome was necessary. Achilles died at Troy because he could see it fall, because, but his name lived on. Um, while well, Alexander died before he could conquer the entire world, but his name is forever etched into mankind's memory. Alexander has indeed left a rather memorable account that has survived down through the ages. However, many do not consider his actions and consequences that would afflict the Near East region after his death. Therefore, it is important to examine his views about those he conquered. Upheaval in the, upheaval in the Orient <clears throat> The battle for supremacy over the Orient started when a young Alexander first stepped foot on Persian soil. The readings Aristotle assigned to him when he was a youth were now real and the adventure ahead was unknown. Alex Alexander could only rely on the readings and the philosophers who would later travel with him. As Alexander moved forward with his ambitions, his achievements rocked not only those in the Orient but also those back home let alone his own men and officer staff, particularly the future Baudacia or successors. Alexander's dream was to unite East and West, but even this notion of a united East and West is in dispute due to 
his prayer that insisted on harmony between quote, Macedonians and Persians, end quote. In reality, this prayer was nothing more than a shadow in that it favored the Macedonians and Greeks over the Persians. Alexander must have understood that when you are burning down the house you conquer, there is going to be little room for unity and trust. The Persian palace he set on fire, though many urged him to save it, arguing among other things, that it was not that it was not seemingly to destroy what was now his own property and that the Asians would not thus be induced to join him. If he seemed determined not to hold fast the sovereignty of Asia, but merely to pass through it in triumph. Alexander, on the contrary, replied that he proposed to punish the Persians and recompense for what for what they had done in their invasion of Greece, for the wrecking of Athens, the burning of the temples, and for all the cruel things they had done to the Greeks. For these, he said, he took vengeance. Interestingly enough, there were those who felt that Alexander did not do as Aristotle taught him, even though the burning of Persian property would seem fit in what Aristotle would want against the barbarians. It seems that his actions may have been a little too much for Plutarch states, quote, for Alexander did not follow Aristotle's advice to treat the Greeks as if he were their leader and other peoples as if he were their master, to have regard for the Greeks as for their friends and kindred, but to conduct himself towards other peoples as if they were, though they were plants or animals. End quote. Alexander did treat others as Aristotle advised. He just kept it concealed by promising the illusion of unity between East and West. Like when the Macedonians were said to have taken Persian wives, but one will see that there is not a trace mentioned of Persian nobles being offered the women of Macedonian uh, for marriage. When one takes another look at Alexander's empire after, death, after his death, his name is scattered about all about the Iranian landscape as the Hellenistic culture he brought, up, brought with him. All things Persian remained in the countryside, unseen and out of mind while Hellenism took root in the urban centers of civilization. The historian uh, Isan Yarshetter, if I'm pronouncing his name right, makes the distinction between the genuine Iranian aspects, which later mixed with the Romantic, when he states, quote, According to genuine Iranian tradition, Alexander destroyed the integrity of the Iranian Empire by undermining the authority of its kings and divided the land among feudatory lords. Further, he ruined fire temples, killed Zoroastrian priests, and destroyed their manuscripts, transferring Persian science and philosophy to Rome, Greece. On the other hand, the legendary tale of Alexander, written by pseudo um, Calisthenes, uh, sometime before the 4th century, was translated into Middle Persian during the 6th century, and, it can, and its content, with some modifications, was later ad adopted by the body of Iranian historical traditions. In the Iranian form of romance, Alexander becomes the son of Dara I, and a half-brother of his adversary, Dara II. Anyway. Alexander the, the Accursed and the Sacking of Persepolis Alexander's conquest of Persia and the sources that speak against him also have labeled him, according to Zoroastrian sources, as Gojac, uh, Gojast, Gojastic, or the accused. These mention Alexander as the great destroyer due to the murdering of Magi priests. It's written that he, that he quote, killed the Magi many teachers, lawyers, herbats, and mobads, end quote. In addition, much of the literature in, Persian, in, in Persia was burnt during the conquest, including the sacred Avesta text. Alex men, Alexander's men burned copies of the original Avesta text kept at Dez and Nepsi, Nepsi, the castle, the castle inscriptions or fortress of archives. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. From then on, Zoroastrian priests would memorize the text and pass on the information through oral tradition until, Parthian, until the Parthian king, Vogasis I, had them written down again. If destroying literature was not enough, Alexander also looted the treasury. Thousands of packed animals were utilized for, in the removal of 2,500 tons of gold from Persepolis. That's a staggering amount. Alexander would take part in, would take part of the treasury with him to fund the war while disposing of the rest in Susa. Adding insult to injury, Alexander also allowed his, quote, soldiers to plunder all but the palaces. 
It was the richest city under the sun, and the private houses had been furnished with every sort of wealth over the years. The Macedonians raced into it, slaughtering all the men whom they met, plundering the residencies. Many of the houses belonged to the common people and were ab abundantly supplied with furniture and wearing, and wearing apparel of every kind. Here much silver was carried off and no little gold, and many rich dresses, gay with sea purple or with gold em embroidery, became the prize of the victors. The enormous palaces famed throughout the whole civilized world fell victim to insult and utter destruction. Alexander's men were getting rich quickly at the expense of the locals, but even that was not enough for many of Alexander's men turned, turned on one another and began to kill each other in the name of profit due to one fellow soldier having more than the other. Moreover, the Persian males whom the soldiers encountered were murdered and the women were taken to be made slaves. The sacking of Persepolis went beyond greed and, moment, and uh, momentarily resembled the landscape of an unbridled nihilism. Alexander had effectively taken Persepolis, the city that he, quote, described it as described it to the Macedonians as the most hateful city, hateful the cities of Asia, end quote, and rendered it useless after all it was looted in its form of glory. This was not the official end of Persepolis, but as a city of importance, its light quickly dimmed. However, Alexander gave the city one last hurrah, in which he held a great funeral party at the people's expense. Quote, as Persepolis had exceeded all other cities in prosperity, so in the same measure it now exceeded all others in misery, end quote. Miseries along with poverty, for the people were raped of their land and their self. However, with such great turmoil comes lasting hope that those affected will be redeemed. If Alexander felt that the unity was close, the inhabitants of Iranian Plateau would not forget the sacking of Persepolis, along with the distasteful actions before and after. Now, if you like that little mini lecture slash article, actually you can find this article um, at my website, www.camry.org. The title of it is Alexander the Great in the Business of War, Part 1. So if you want to read that article, go to www.camry.org. That's www.camrea.org. And leave your comments below, no fighting, and I will post part two here shortly.